This man is one of Britain's leading robot experts. He's a professor of computer science at the University of Sheffield, and for the past 10 years, he's been making machines that can learn and interact like animals. One of the most exciting things about my job is it's really like working with toys but toys that provide a very strong intellectual challenge. His latest work on display at the Magna Center is a family of predator and prey robots. And here they are in action. These robots have quite literally been evolving over the last four months. By programming simple rules into their neural networks, or electronic brains, Noel has created robotic predators and prey that over generations can learn for themselves. They're programmed so that the solar-powered prey, using infrared sensors, avoid the predators. The predators seek out their prey to steal their energy. Noel's attempt to make them behave like animals goes far beyond hunting. He even has a breeding scheme. He mixes the software of the most successful robots in the hope of creating even better ones. No, you're several generations down the line now. What kind of patterns have you seen emerge for both the predators and the prey? One of the most interesting things we've seen was about a week ago. It was quite amusing. We were standing in here, and one of the prey, for the first time, managed to find the lights. Uh, they've got to go under the lights to get their energy. Right. But it went under the lights, and another one came along and hit it a thump and knocked it out of the way, which was quite amusing, unexpected. Amazing. But it doesn't stop there. Noel's ambition is to get his robots into the sky. And this is it, the Flyborg. This flying robot has been given the ability to react to its surroundings and learn from its experiences. OK, talk me through the Flyborg. Well, what, what you can see here is a microprocessor, and that's connected to lots of little PIC processors, and that's the central control for the robot. Right. And what you've got in here as well, in among this mess, is our gyroscopes and accelerometers, and they're there to keep the robot flying in a straight line and maintain it in that direction, despite wind blowing it sideways or whatever. Now, these wires here, you can see there are lots and lots of wires, little fine wires that you can't see from a distance, and they're connected up to these little grills up here, and these are the sonar sensors. Uh, and they work very much like uh, bat sensors, so they send out a sound signal, get it back again, and time how long that took, and that tells it how far it is away from an obstacle. But we have software in there that uh, will hold very, very simple rules that will tell it, for instance, not to fly too close to a wall or to fly close to another uh, flyborg. But the neural network's much more flexible, so it will be learning to deal with wind currents and general sort of flux in the air. Up until now, the Flyborg has been remote controlled, but now it's time to let it loose. It begins its first ever flight on its own, sensing its way around the workshop with a few minor hiccups. You must start a project like this. You don't know what's going to happen when you take it off the remote control. What do you reckon there? That was, I thought that was amazing. I mean, that's the first time we've seen it. They've been up all night working on this, and so they haven't had time to program it properly, but it was working completely on its own there, so that's the kind of thing we really want to see. Was there anything a bit sporadic that you weren't quite expecting? Yes, yes. well, the, the sonars are supposed to keep it at a set level, and it was going up and down a little bit, but they'll, they'll have it fine-tuned very quickly. After some minor readjustments, it's time for the big test. The Flyborg is aimed directly at a wall, and the remote control switched off, leaving it to fend for itself. Success! The Flyborg has detected the wall. The information from its sonar sensors is sent to the onboard computer, which has been programmed to avoid getting closer than four meters to any object. The computer takes into account information from the gyroscopes and accelerometers and issues instructions to the motors to avoid collision. Wow, and that's all autonomous? Completely, yes. That was, better than, that was better than even than I expected in I was going to say, did yeah. you think it would do this well? No, I mean, it's only a test of avoidance so far, but even so, it's, it's doing it well because it's got, there's a lot to do in there. Okay. Absolutely fantastic, and we have Noel here at the NEC. And just to give you an idea of the size of the Flyborg, we have a couple of them here. Now, Noel, you're constantly trying to improve yes. on your inventions yes. and your robots. What have you done since that first test flight to the Flyborg? 
Well, the first thing was pretty obvious. You notice it kept crashing into the ground on the on the film, so we we fixed the sensors underneath so that it stays at a good height. Oh, I hope you're right about that. Yes, we I'm are. Right underneath this yes, one. We have. What else? And we've added a little bit of learning to it, but we've also added these uh, sensors, which was planned, and these are infrareds, which will help them identify each other. Uh, as long as they don't fall on our heads at the moment. Now you're hoping to have ten of these. Yes. Why? Well, because we're, we're interested in, in flocking behaviour, so we've got mathematical models of flocking, but we don't know what will actually emerge from this, from the rules and from the models. It might be a herd, like a herd of buffalo, it might be like a school of whales, yeah. or it might be like a, a, a traditional V-shape for flocking. Or maybe they'll just go into the corners and salt, but that's science. That is science indeed. Please promise me that you'll keep us up to date, and when we have ten of them flocking, we can see them. You will certainly will. Okay, thank you very thank much. Thank you very much.